Tonight, Microsoft's not the only company reading your email. Turkish citizens are fighting a Twitter ban and why legendary game cartridges are stuck underground. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 49 for Friday, March 21st, 2014. I'm Jason Howell. Let's get right to the tech feed. All right, first up, yesterday we reported on Microsoft's admission that it read a journalist's Hotmail account in an attempt to track down the source of an internal leak on Windows 8 source code. But Microsoft isn't alone. Webmail services from Apple, Yahoo, and Google are all reserved the right to read users' email if they believe that such access is necessary to protect their property. Following the revelation, Microsoft's Deputy General Counsel told The Guardian that it would be tightening up its privacy policy. But other major email providers all reserve basically the same rights in their own terms of services. However, currently only Microsoft is sharing the internal procedures it has to govern who can access users' email without a court order and the reasons behind a search. Yahoo declined to comment, and neither Apple nor Google has responded to requests for comment. The moral here? Read the terms of service, really. In other Microsoft news, the company's official support for Windows XP ends on April 8th. In order to coax users onto Windows 8, Microsoft is giving out $100 discounts on a number of computers, such as the Surface Pro 2, which comes with 90 days of free support for their new Windows 8 device from Microsoft. But those that don't upgrade, once general support for Windows XP ends, anyone using XP will be using an unpatched operating system that is incredibly insecure and vulnerable to exploits. Just imagine for a moment how many XP users will not understand that. Yesterday, citizens in Turkey faced a nationwide Twitter ban via DNS block in a reported attempt for the nation's prime minister, Recep Erdogan, to stop the spread of leaked recordings that point to a corruption scandal. Since then, many Turkish citizens have found a way to circumvent the block via Google's free DNS service, and word is spreading quickly. The Wall Street Journal reports that tweets sent in Turkey are up 138% today, according to data published by Brandwatch, a firm that analyzes social media analytics. As for the ban itself, a Turkish official tells Reuters that it was made possible through an earlier court decision and clarifies that, quote, at the moment there is no such decision for other social media like Facebook, end quote. For now, Twitter is officially advising users in Turkey to send tweets via SMS. And over the last year, Google's technology lab, Google X, has acquired several companies that make robot parts, which is a first for many roboticists who have had to rely on military-funded projects in the past. But for those acquired companies, Boston Dynamics and Shaft still have obligations to the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, for at least a year. Google and DARPA have very different visions, but the two are now intertwined over the DARPA Robotics Challenge because five of eight qualifying teams are using humanoid called Atlas, made by Google, uh, now Google-owned Boston Dynamics. In an effort to distance itself from the tech giant, DARPA is said to be considering an additional competition track where teams build their own robot without DARPA funding and not based on Atlas. The finals may be postponed between December 2014 and June 2015 to give the teams more time to get ready. Now, coming up, a documentary about the, quote, worst game ever made hits a show-stopping snag. But first, joining me right now is Ken Hess, freelance technical writer for ZDNet and Frugal Networker. Welcome to the show, Ken. Hey, thanks, Jason. Absolutely. It's good to have you here. Uh, so recently, you did what I'm sure a lot of people might be curious to do themselves. They've never actually done it, probably. You're, you've dedicated yourself to Chrome OS entirely for the month of February, and you wrote about your experience on ZDNet. So I suppose the first question in a story like this has to be, how did it go for you? It went very well. I really enjoyed it. You know, it was a little rough at first, but, um, you know, it, it went surprisingly well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I would say that one of the biggest kind of fears that people have in, you know, in trying out Chrome OS or even dedicating themselves to it would be that working, at, you know, all the time in a browser-based OS would be far too limiting compared to what they might be used to on other laptops. Did you find this to be true or was there solace in that simplicity? You know, I used the Chrome browser all the time in my own work, so that really wasn't such a big deal for me. The only thing that was really kind of annoying at first was editing images, mm -hmm. you know, graphics. And, you know, I found Pixlr 
which is really a good app. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, that's what I used for uh, image editing. Sure. Were there any other any other kind of challenges? Or I mean, it sounds like from from reading through your writing, uh, it was kind of a positive experience for the most part. It was very good. I didn't really have any other challenges because, like I said, I live most of my time in a browser, you know, online writing and uh, browsing the web and, and everything. The only thing was the image editing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I got used to it. it. It worked out very well. Sure. Now, the Chromebook that you used was the Acer C710, not necessarily a cutting edge, top of the line device. Uh, you can find them online for $200. How did the hardware that you used affect, uh, affect your experience? You know, surprisingly, I didn't really notice. I mean, it's mm -hmm. instant on. As soon as you open the thing, it's it's on, it's ready. I log on and poof, you know, everything I need is there, which is a browser and all my apps, and they're all browser-based. So I didn't really notice that there was any performance issues or, or anything. Everything was instantaneous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were talking before the show about how, you know, a couple of years, both both you and I, <laughs> separately, obviously, uh, had our own experiences with Chrome OS where it wasn't that great, but then we came, we you know, looped around a few years later and tried it out. I'm now using the Chromebook Pixel. I'm a huge fan of the Pixel. Um, do you see yourself kind of switching to Chrome OS full time or are you kind of going back to the old ways? No, you know, I think that um, for the most part, I'm going to use my Chromebook. Of course, I can't use it at work, but for my own personal use, I would probably use it 100% of the time, mm -hmm. except um, my wife bought me a Mac Mini several months ago, and I feel obligated to use it. So, <laughs> Sure. It was that a makes... little pricey. So, I mean, $200 Chromebook, $800 yeah. Mac Mini. I mean, what are you going to do? And, and you know, the wife bought it for you. So you probably <laughs> should give that some good use. Uh, and mm -hmm. finally, the question that everybody wants to know after something like this, do you recommend others do the same? Would you buy this for the person that you love or the person that you hate? Well, uh, funny you should ask. I gave my son one. He just graduated. Well, he's about to graduate from high school. And <clears throat> I gave him a, a Chromebook and he loves it. He was, uh, you know, we were both watching Netflix earlier on it. Mm -hmm. Um, he was watching a, an episode of Archer, and I was watching something else on it. So, uh, you know, I love him, so I gave him one. I would probably give an enemy one, too, uh, <laughs> just so <clears throat> they might not be an enemy. After right. that. <laughs> yeah, that that and hey, they're they're pretty darn inexpensive, so you could probably afford to do so as well. Well, Ken, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. Where can people find your work online? At ZDNet, uh, you can find me in the consumerization blog or the virtualization blog, and also on my own blog site called frugalnetworker.com. Uh, thank you so much, Ken. It was great having you on. No problem. Thank you. Absolutely. Now, finally, anyone curious about the backstory that surrounds the Atari 2600 game E.T., the extraterrestrial, I have a copy right here, pretty kind of crazy, uh, is likely interested in an upcoming documentary on the topic. And if you were holding out hope for that documentary, you might have to wait a little bit longer. Environmental regulators in New Mexico have brought the planned excavation of a legendary stockpile of game cartridges buried somewhere in the desert to a grinding halt, citing the need for an approved waste excavation plan, which... I'm sure the team will be be able to secure at some point in the future, but it is important to remember that this game was the beginning of the end for Atari and their glorious reign at the top of the video game industry in the 80s. So let's hope the game doesn't exert its dream-destroying powers and claim yet another victim, because I really want to see this flick, like, really bad. That's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2 and write us, of course, at TN2 at twit.tv. Our next newscast will be Monday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Jason Howell. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.